Yeah, here's Heidi from the Wisdom Factory. And uh, I was in South Africa to the Integral Tour and the Integral Conference. And I asked my friends, Ryan, and also Paul, and maybe somebody else will still pop in, to help me to debrief what was happened there by asking their questions. And I'm very glad that they did that, that they do it. And so over to you. And just ask me what you want to ask. Yeah, well, um, I thought we could start out. First of all, Heidi, it's great to great to see you uh, back. And I'm very curious to, to explore a lot of things. Maybe to start, you can just kind of give some background context to people who don't know about what the Africa Integral Tour was. Just kind of tell them what that was all about. Yeah. Um, it, it was sort of a package. Um, I went from twice or three times to the Integral European Conference. And so this year was not the camp conference, but a sort of regathering in uh, Vienna. And it was always a habit after the uh, regathering or also the conference to do a tour. So far we did tours in Hungary and I participated and I found it really good. We went to spiritual places or cultural places. And also in the regathering in Vienna, Vienna where I've never had participated, uh, they went to Austria. And this year they planned first the regathering Vienna and then go over to Africa and do the tour in Africa. And then there was, uh, at the end of the planned tour, was the Integral uh, African Conference, the first conference in Africa about integral and spiral dynamics. And, you know, uh, it's amazing. And so I thought, oh, alone I wouldn't go to Africa because it seems weird to me. I had no idea of Africa. It always seems far away, you know, and I never wrapped my head around it. But with integral people, some of them I already knew. And I always had a good uh, experience, you know, to be uh, in the midst of, of these people, because that's always different, you know, always um, different way of talking to each other of, or accept, uh, accepting each other. That's really, you know, I always like that. And so I just uh, subscribed for it and uh, I went uh, also because I wanted to finally get out of my house, which a year ago when my husband was about to die, I said, after that, I need to do something. And so uh, it didn't happen so far. And I thought, so that's now the sort of, let's say, gift or whatever it is to me uh, and I spend all this money because it's not really cheap, but uh, get me this experience. And so I went without knowing a lot about Africa because it was never in my in my in my mind to to be much interested i have a friend she is often in senegal and helps people to create uh, wells and things yeah i heard a little bit but never really considered it and yeah and so i went and i found my way even to the hotel alone from the airport and also things didn't work out as they should but yeah it was a great experience from the first moment on i thought oh wow <laughs> and I felt open to, to the experience and um, yeah, that's the context. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know how you want to do this, but I'm thinking maybe you can kind of walk us through mm -hmm. chronologically. So you got there and then what happened? I got there and I went to the, to the hotel, which was quite outside of Johannesburg. A nice place, even swimming pool, nice and everything, but it's winter there, you know. I came from, from uh, Italy where spring didn't really want to happen, and uh, I thought there might be a bit warmer, but yeah, during the day it's quite warm, but it, the swimming pool I would never have used, <laughs> so cold. And at night it was cold and I didn't figure out the heating and I, 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 I froze quite a lot and I didn't imagine that. But anyway, yeah, the first day um, in the evening and other two people arrived and the next day the next uh, people arrived. There were 14 participants of the tour and the tour started there. Uh, 
the hotel, I don't know why it was so far outside, but it was nice. It was, you know, you, you saw giraffes when you went uh, a little bit further and there was a nice uh, river went through. And once I saw an alligator like uh, animal on, on a hanging bridge going over the, um, the river. And so the first impressions of wildlife uh, I had there, that was nice. And from there, we went with a bus and the first, let's say, the idea was by uh, Rika, Rika Villoin, she is sort of organizing the whole thing or her idea was, or she was the mother of everything. She was so great in, in taking care of everything and so friendly and, and, and wonderful. And also her son, Ruan, and there were other two people uh, with us on the tour. Rene, one and the other, who now I forgot his name. He was a, uh, he has a, a wild animal park somewhere uh, in the north of uh, South Africa. Anyway, we had uh, competent people to guide us. And so the idea was to show us through the spiral, to let us live the spiral by, by our own experience. So the first thing, the first day, we got the uh, assignment to not show any camera and anything, have everything in your pocket, keep things tight because we were about to go into the city, uh, which is considered not a super safe place. So, because there are a lot of poor people there, you know, and so crime uh, is um, there. The interesting thing is uh, one of the participants, Johan, he has grown up in South Africa and um, went away 20 years ago. And he said when he was studying in Johannesburg, <clears throat> this part of um, the center of Johannesburg was completely different. And now it looked a little bit more like uh, third world. And the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the government trying to change that by building in the middle of that huge uh, almost skyscrapers to, you know, so it is this strange contradiction between these modern buildings and the decaying part and the little shops and the, you know, the, yeah, and the people. So the first thing we saw more or less, the first thing was uh, homeless people, you know, running around with a beard and with a, a blanket around and, and, yeah, quite shocking. But you know, homeless people are everywhere. But when you see uh, here the, the amount of poor people and the amount of people coming from other countries, they have a migration, um, a refugee or better migration uh, reality, which we don't know. We think it's only Europe that uh, people arrive. But no, South Africa is considered the maybe it was considered the well-off country of Africa. So Zimbabwe, <clears throat> the other countries around, the young people think when you go to Johannesburg, okay, Brown, <clears throat> you can make a future. And some did too. We had uh, at a certain, a second day, we had um, a talk of a person who uh, described his life and he really did this. And he managed to become a professor in a, in a high-class business school. But he did really from the bottom up. It was very interesting. I have recorded this, but I, at the moment I have no access to the recording. So I, I hope I will get it and then I will um, post it because it's so interesting. But I do think these are exceptions that people really uh, make it. He started, he said, with collecting plastic uh, and uh, get some pennies for it. And the reality is in, you see it everywhere, these people trying to invent something to survive. So the base survival um, uh, level was very, very clear, visible, you know. And then we went into blue. There is a huge house which has uh, once was the huge, um, I think, I don't know how many stories, but 
I've even forgotten the name of this house. It's it's very prominent, a round building. And once it was the, the place for the very rich and after apartheid, then it changed everything. And then, you know, at the moment, I think that's mainly not so rich people. And, but I heard that the richer people come back, but they are mainly black now before they were definitely not black. And there is a, an initiative of people who give a space to children to come there in the afternoon and play and or learn. The older ones read to the younger ones. And we saw this reality and I was astonished because there were in a, row, in a room maybe 100 square meters, maybe a little bigger, but not much. And there were about 40, 50 children and in our countries, at least as far as I know, they would scream and shout and run around and things. They were not silent, they, but they were self-organizing in a way which seemed like a dance. That was really amazing. So that was the attempt of, of Blue, of giving space to, to, to come into an orderly way, a, a, a safe way of being together for the for the children, you know, and getting also some support for learning and so on. It was very nice. And then the next thing was we went into a shopping mall and this was orange, super, super luxurious. And so we went from, from beige to blue to orange. And you cannot imagine the, the difference, you know, that was so striking. I, I think I never have seen this in Europe, you know? So, uh, and this is definitely not only white people who are buying things in the, in the shopping mall. That was, a, mm, I think mainly black people and white people are only 12% anymore in, in South Africa. So they are not many. So uh, racism obviously is a, is a big thing, but maybe we come there later. And the next day we went to the Apartheid Museum and this was hmm, shocking. Many things I didn't know. I would have liked to spend more time to, there were many videos of the time, you know, um, document, documentaries or news station videos and, and many, many ways to understand what has happened. <laughs> and as an experience, you get a ticket and then it uh, is written black or white, you know, independent of your color, you get this ticket. And then you have to go into the entrance for the blacks or for the whites, what is on your, on your ticket. And this already feels quite weird, I have to say, when you, when you don't know a, a thing like this, you know. And then uh, we came to understand that, I think yesterday when we talked about the racism and skin color, that the skin color was not such an obvious thing. There was an institution in South Africa with the apartheid and uh, the people, many changed from white into black and uh, some black people changed into, into white, but not at their own will, but because somebody has figured out because of, I don't know what uh, criteria, they are not white, although they, look like white, but they are black. And so they get into the category black. So seeing this, you, you come and see that's absurd, absurd. You know, if it is color of the skin, okay, then it's color of the skin. Then you are either white or brown or, uh, or black or whatever, or yellow or green, you know. But then it's not about the color of the, uh, of the skin because somebody obviously looking like white gets classified as black. How is that possible? You know, so this many of these contradictions for our way of seeing things, they immediately went into my face like, oh, how is that possible? And then there were all the rules which they put into law of the apartheid system. And these were really crazy. And people said, if they hadn't put it into law, that wouldn't have been so bad because some way you, you find, you know, find a way of coexisting, but this was written into law. 
mixed marriages were absolutely forbidden, you know, and many, many other things. I can't really remember. It's often so absurd to read this that you don't want even to, to remember. So that was the second day. And I forgot what we did. But this was very, very, very impressive, the museum. Anyway, we were still around, um, around Johannesburg. Maybe it comes later. And the next day we started to go north, right north. Ah, that's another thing. I, I discovered how much we are uh, ha habitual creatures, you know? Because in the in the hotel, that's a lovely arena with with uh, trees and benches and water and everything, and <clears throat> I saw the sun going up there and going down there, and I thought, hey, does here the sun go out uh, go up in the rise in the west, and goes down in the east? Seems strange to me. And then. You know, it took me some time to understand that in South Africa or all countries below the equator, the sun is in the north and not in the south. So we always, we always are so in our mind that the sun, where the sun is, is south, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it still gets up in the, in the east and goes down in the west, but the sun stands in the north and not in the south. So, I mean, it's logic. It's somebody who is in that uh, discussion, uh, they know it, but just as an experience thinking uh, something strange and how much <clears throat> we are fixed into our habits and our assumptions, how the world is, you know. In the south, it's warm, which I thought South Africa is warm, <laughs> maybe some other time, but not now. <laughs> yeah, so. And we went north and we went to a sort of a safari in an open uh, bus and that was cold from four to six. As soon as the sun went away, it was the wind from the open car was one thing, but then we were freezing like crazy. <laughs> but wonderful uh, houses. We, we, that would be a place, for instance, to go and do a retreat in eight people. They have two houses together with an inside courtyard and, and really, really beautiful, as you imagine, a safari life. <laughs> and you get the instructions, don't go uh, on your own through high grass. You can go where the grass is cut, but they have all sorts of, <clears throat> you know, snakes and stuff, which I wouldn't like to encounter, but uh, there were gazelles, you say gazelles, antelopes uh, coming near the house and uh, that was nice. <laughs> and some strange birds, so. Yeah, that was that. And then the next day we went further north east to Tsanin. That is a, a, a little town or city I don't know, something in the middle, which is quite touristic. So it had a, a Western look. And then only about 20 kilometers from that, we went into a village, where, which consists of only four or five houses together. <coughs> and we saw the Sargomas, the, the healers, the shamanic healers, before we arrived in the village. And everybody who wanted could have a go and get, you know, they have, uh, oh, I have them here. They have a sort of um, sh bone, little bones and shells and uh, stones and whatever, and they throw it out. And then <clears throat> they read, or let you throw it out, and then they read the position <clears throat> and tell you things. And I was super astonished. Most of the things she told me were exactly right. Some of them were, yeah, maybe. I did ask a different question because she, she says to ask a question, but she doesn't even understand English well. And the question everybody should ask in their own language. And so I don't think that she understood German. 
Uh, <laughs> and um, the first thing she said to me is, your husband died. Oops. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's already, you know, was mind mind blowing. And she said, you are still worrying a lot and, and, and things like that. And uh, many other things, but I don't want to go into detail. But this was one of the moments when I thought, oh, maybe that's not all woo woo, <laughs> because how can she know? How can she know? Nobody told her. <laughs> and I didn't certainly. So um, yeah, that was very interesting. The houses seem to be nice. You look from outside and think they are villas or something and you go in and it's poverty in many ways. It's not much in, especially no water tap and no bathroom. The bathroom was really uh, outside and at the edge of where I want to go. <laughs> but you know, that's a reality. They wanted us to, to see again, because 100 years ago in our countries, it was like this. You know? It doesn't mean that all South Africa is like, like this, but there are areas in South Africa and for sure in the rest of Africa where life is like this. And they got us up at six in the morning and we had to go where people go to get the water. Everybody with a little container and get the water, 15 minutes down the hill and um, then bring up the water, what the women do twice, three times a day to get some water. So it's just relative, rel making relative our way of being spoiled in our cultures. You know, it gives you a, a coming back down to earth <laughs> in some way and beginning to be more grateful for what we have instead of thinking that should be better all the time. Yeah, that was mainly the, the tour. And people were very much in, in purple, but a beautiful purple. From the very first moment arriving at the airport, people are like, like, I don't know, radiant, radiant, shiny eyes, uh, friendly, laughing, and seemingly lighthearted, you know. And even the ones who, are, who don't have anything, but they are not like, you know, a German person would be like, oh, oh, oh I'm so poor, and, da, 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 and would complain. I didn't see that. I sa saw the energy to make out of it, out of the situation, something. It can be rebellion when you go into red, no? And there is enough red uh, organizations you know, uh, who uh, go into rebellion and seems to be at the moment was uh, forces there who instead of healing, try to divide people again, blacks against whites, you know, and uh, that's not a good thing. But this was then addressed also in, in the conference because then the day afterwards the conference started. That's just as an overview and now I leave you with questions. <laughs> wow, that was a that was a lot <laughs> to take in in a short amount of time. So, what I'm really curious to ask you is about how you know you had this direct experience with a completely different culture, a completely different consciousness. You know, and how was that? How was that transformative, or how was, how did that really change your perception in a way that? reading about these things or watching videos on these things did not. Yeah, yeah. That's absolutely true that uh, reading or, or hearing about it is, is different than seeing it and living it in the first person, you know. And uh, one thing is to see, as I said, the, the prim primitiveness of housing and of uh, the struggle for existence, for, for survival and to get a certain status in life and a certain uh, possibility. The other thing which really shocked me was the difference of, you know, the huge gap between, between the have-nots and the, the haves. 
and how they obviously don't really get things together. There was the the tendency, what I heard, to to get rights out of um, the the business, let's say, and replace uh, it with uh, black people. But the thing is, the schools have degraded, and there is an example they told us that there are perfect power plants, working power plants somewhere, I don't know, near Cape Town or somewhere, but um, they don't have the, the people with the know-how to keep them running. Because, um, you know, when you substitute just for uh, skin color and not for skill, it's not a good idea. And they obviously in schools have also leveled down uh, the, 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 the ability, or how do you say, the, 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 the votes, because everybody is good, you know, uh, everybody should. And so the, the possibility to get a better education is only there when you pay because uh, otherwise it gets level, too much leveled down and the, the gifted people don't get the, um, the education they, they would need to, to reach uh, a certain skill level and for then uh, go up in society. So that also for me is a, a short, how do you say, sh circuit, um, you know, when electricity comes with water and then it blows out. Uh, by wanting to, to, to do something good, by having everybody in school and nobody left behind, they at the same time, not only they, that's where things like that happen, they don't educate skilled people. And so society at, as a whole uh, cannot survive, you know because there is not enough um, skilled people. And so the division comes again, because those who really uh, want to, 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 to make a good profession must have money to, to get the education. That was, you know, hearing this, it was heartbreaking, because it's a socialist ideas which run against reality <laughs> and against people themselves. It's a short-term gain to have uh, done school with uh, supermarks and afterwards you don't, you are not able to do anything. That's, um, I heard that's partly in America too. I don't know, Mark said that in the past. I don't know if you have this experience. So what has changed in, in me is really the, the being touched by what I saw and what I lived and really connecting, despite some hesitation, connecting with this reality and seeing how people live it. You know, many of my assumptions of my ideas of life, which I had before became so much more relative by seeing how other people uh, struggle and how they, encounter life and also seeing all the errors you know which are made by in as i said before by the idea of doing something good and then actually not so it reminded me of our own errors and how humanity humanity obviously needs to make their own errors all the time again and again and again <laughs> until we understand something or maybe never i don't know anyway I don't know if it this satisfies your question. Yeah, that, uh, Paul, did you want to ask something? I've been kind of. Yeah, I was. Uh, I was curious about. I guess the the thing with the tribe like that. I really lit up hearing about the the shaman and the um, the radiance. I think you said about the way that people embody. I'm sort of curious if there was something you particularly took away, or um, if there was a a difference maybe in your preconceptions, like what you thought pup or tribe or um, some some prior idea um, being different to your, your actual lived experience? You know, I went there without having a lot of ideas. I knew the existing stereotypes. I tried not to, to buy into that, you know, about primitiveness and all this stuff and the poor, poor people. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I I just took in, you know, I lived this two weeks uh, in this 
uh, endorphin state, I would say, <laughs> uh, because uh, I, I could hardly sleep. Uh, it was like so many things coming in and it kept, kept me awake without uh, this constant thinking about it. It was just like a being all the time, you know, uh, receiving, let's say. Hmm. So I tribe, you mean in the village, I saw the people so, <sighs> I don't know a right word, so normal, you know, not primitive at all, ca capable of speaking, capable of telling the stories and telling the their reality, talking about themselves, talking about their situation. And um, the ones who, who, who knew English, and not everybody in these remote areas know English, but the young ones do. And their attempt to, to make uh, live a normal family life, which is normal for them. The men normally, if they have work, they go away, work, and the, the women stay at home. But some women, uh, one of the women is was an employee of our um, leading person. So she is always in Johannesburg and goes home only once a month to see her daughter. So the sacrifices they do to, to lead a, a life, which is a little bit better than uh, it was before. Then the other interesting thing was they were telling us that they have a king and they Practically, the king and the government of the country coexist, and they pay taxes to both. But the main, for them, the main authority is the king. And um, I think at the moment when I understood it right, I didn't understand all of that. It was, you know, the language as it is spoken there is quite difficult. Until I understood, for instance, that work, they said weg until I understood that VAC means work, uh, it, it took some time. So with many words, uh, I had a difficulty to, to get. So I might not understand everything right, but that seems that at the moment, the old king is dead and the new king is still young and is about to be, uh, how do you say, inaugurated uh, as a new king. But somehow it seems to be a double government. One is the tribe's government and one is the, the, the official government. And somehow they go um, together. And the other thing uh, which I really loved when we were at the shaman's place, there were some little huts and houses and so, and then the children came from uh, school. We saw them far away on a playground, on a, on a meadow and they were still in their uniforms. And then they came uh, and then they showed up in, in normal clothes, bare feet, and they began to play. And they played, you know, they had made a ball out of plastic bags and they played uh, shooting, you know, two people, one on the other side, or one group of people on the other side, on the other side, in the middle, other group of people, and uh, they tried to shoot them. And then when they got them, they had to go out and things like this, you know. And that was so much fun. Uh, children of all age, at the end, one of our people went in too and played with them. That was a, a merry play, you know, like this, this childlike joy in doing things and in moving and, and doing things in movement. And, and I think our Western world has lost that, you know? And they, they, they did it for hours and hours. And then some of the children came, we were sitting there waiting, came on sitting on the lap. And then the, the episode I told you about a, about 10 year old child who carried a baby and the baby saw me and was in fear because obviously they don't see a lot of white people there. And it's always the first time. And for this baby, probably it was the first time to see a person who looked like a ghost or whatever she thought that it was. Yeah. Um, this 
lifeliness, this energetic way of being in the world without complaining, but just taking taking the, the, the situation as it is and do something, you know? And children, perfect, really, it was nice. And then another thing I wanted to say, that they told us that the government often tries to install from above things, and that never works. And now for the city of Johannesburg, which is in problems, now it seems to be self-organizing, that there are blocks and people uh, have responsibility for these blocks and for the safety. And so that's not official people, you know, that's people who are living there or taking off uh, over the task from their tribe. I don't know if they are an official tribe or just the tribe of them being together in this area. And that seems to be very promising that they, from the bottom up, create structures. But it takes some time and the interference on, of, from above always seems to be either ignored or be damaging. That's what they told us. But you know, when we went there, you could see uh, some black guys with a stick or something just standing around and uh, taking care that things shouldn't happen, you know? And no police, no police. So the thing is when you get dropped, the, they say they get away with it. There is no, nobody to defend you, nobody official, maybe some friend or so, but um, no, accusation or things like that. So you better take care for your things, you know. And even when in the in the better areas where better uh, earning whites and blacks live, they have normally a porter, do you say porter, who is in the entrance, sitting in the entrance, and then in front of the main gate, a little wooden hut, and there's another person um, uh, paying attention. But at the end, if something happens, my friend told me they have no way to, to do anything. So the presence of police is, <laughs> the absence of police is uh, notable. So it's difficult to, 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 to handle crime. And as I, as I said, they try it from the bottom up. We see how it works. But then with the resentment against white people, it's it's a it's a it's a how do you say a powder pot as far as I've understood. And sometimes it felt like it. So I, I, I took the, the admonition, the photo camera in your pocket, you know, and don't have any uh, jewelry. I, I never wear it anyway, but um, don't give the occasion and also don't leave your things um, far away from you, not even a meter because um, Rika told us in purple, when they see an object there and they take it because they, they don't see it as stealing, it, it's there. Yeah, okay, I can take it, you know. So uh, you better take care if you don't want to have a, an experience and then get excited or angry, you know. So that was a lesson of not assuming that everybody has the same ethical or whatever standards as you have. And they, they would respect you. And I think they do respect you, but they don't understand that you don't take care for your stuff. <laughs> Let's say in this way. Um, uh, unless you have something else, Paul, I was gonna. Sorry, sorry, say that again. Oh, I was just gonna, another question. Oh, yeah, were you going to ask a follow up or? Um, yeah, it's sort of, it sounds to me, Heidi, like, especially the part, I guess I'm really sort of gravitating to the powerful, but um, like that you, you fit in really well. Like, I could imagine maybe having a culture clash and being like, uh, finding it difficult. And it almost sounds like, which I guess kind of has to be sort of heartwarming in the, in the kind of nature of a tribe that, especially the i know you said you didn't want to um go into detail about the shaman but especially like you know this deep dive with this person who managed to pick up like this really deep stuff even though you you know you don't even speak the same language 
and all this radiance. So I'm, I'm curious if that was actually the case, that it was quite an easy, like you just kind of uh, went into it and found it very easy to, um, uh, what's the word? I guess integrate. I, I, I almost cringe at this sort of bringing the <laughs> integral word into it, but like finding it easy to ingratiate and also um, like what it's like to come back out and like how it compares to your life before. Like uh, I, I can imagine extrapolating like loneliness is a big epidemic in sort of the Western world and stuff like this. And it sounds like such a contrast. So I'm sort of curious about um, how you see uh, the society you live in now um, by comparison. And also if that was actually the case, that it was, it was uh, sounds like very easy for you to just immediately get in touch with purple and be relating to people and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I think you are right. It was astonishingly easy. Maybe it's not the right word, but you know, I was just open to, to let it happen to, 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 to curious. I think curious. I was super curious to, to see. And it was like, you know, a child when it sees the first time strange things and ah, like wonder, wonder, wonder. And so I, I don't think I had any prejudices uh, against uh, people and just, yes, I took care for my things. That was okay. But I, I allowed myself to, to see and perceive. And I saw that <laughs> in many ways, it's much better than you would think, but differently better. I saw that our criteria of seeing life are so relative. They are not, <laughs> they are not universal and we think they are universal. You know, that was my first very big insight also in the conference. It was a black person, I've for forgotten what he said, uh, what his name was, but he said that it's not so much that we maybe it's so much, but not only that we occupied and, and colonialized we Europeans, the rest of the world, but what we did, which is much more severe in a certain sense, we exported our way of thinking, our way of believing, our way of, of seeing the world, our, our approach to life as the only possible and we spread it all over the world and we very much destructed destroyed with that uh, other people's um, approach to life or we call it primitive or we want to missionary them and we destroy their culture which is they they t t taught me that it's not primitive at all that they have life skills which we don't have so uh, different, different, yes. And not in our uh, categories of thinking and, and living, but, but we have this arrogance to think how we do life, how we develop then science and whatever, you know, and philosophy and so that's the only way. And I realized that I believed that too. Up to that point, I, got the first insight of, oh, maybe the world could look differently if we had other assumptions, basic assumptions of, about how life is and should go. If maybe some other culture would have spread out their way of looking at the world. And this is for me totally independent of levels of development. That is just a, the ground basic axioms of life in this world. And we have, and still insist that ours are the only ones and the right ones. Or maybe we don't even exist because we don't even see that there could be another way. <laughs> and uh, we negate other possibilities. And in our philosophies, for instance, Ken Wilber and so on, we are trying to do something, but it's still the same, the same line. It's, it's our way of thinking, our way of believing, our way of making theory and uh, science and so. 
and we assume that's the only one. And just to imagine if you had another approach, what different things could have come out, we have, we have no idea. Who knows, you know? So for me, the big insight was really that we are probably unconsciously super arrogant in, in the European and American and Western world. And, and the other countries now and pop, pop, people are, let's say, uh, stupid enough to adopt our way of and giving up their own way, which is not helpful. And I was thinking about the pa parallel, what women did to, to be, go out into the world. They tried to become men and they still do in a big, um, so a big amount instead of developing and asserting their own way of being in the world. And that's the same thing with the cultures. Uh, they try to be better, better us, <laughs> the Chinese or whatever, they are coming up in our terms and they give up their own terms, at least to a large degree. And this is, for me, it is now as I see it now, it's a, a loss. We are not only losing species uh, every day by our climate uh, catastrophe, but we are losing also possibilities of human life, ways of human life on this uh, um, planet, which I don't mean only the survival thing. Yeah, I, I mean also the, the way of looking in the world. And that was quite shocking, I have to say. And so I got, now I'm, I'm much more relative to, to what, what I see, what I'm doing and what I'm, I always have this second binary, which is saying, oh, okay, is it really, maybe it could be different, you know? So uh, I'm not so convinced anymore that we Westerners with our ideas are on the right track. <laughs> And with many results we have now, you know, with all the problems, these are the problems because of our Western way of, uh, of handling life. And yeah, so it makes me think. Is it uh, answering your question, Paul? Yeah, yeah, there's a, I don't know, there's almost a way that I can, obviously it's not a direct experience of what you went through, but almost like carrying some of the, the energy of Africa that it's kind of, uh, um, I don't know, I guess it's hard to put words to, but I sort of extrapolate that, that maybe I shouldn't, like that there is a sort of more primal uh, something that you get in touch with instead of like trying to instantly rationalize and sort of um, map it out with sort of too much theory and stuff like this. Um, I guess I was, I don't know, I sort of feel almost like humbled, like, um, uh almost like realizing the depth of what we're possibly missing is way bigger than we realize and maybe like really important, especially with the kind of tribal thing I think of like, it almost makes me wonder, do we need tribes to pull us out of, like that we couldn't do it on our own kind of thing? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that's the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I think you said it yesterday or wrote it somewhere that uh, yes, the tribal um, consciousness once had uh, human sacrifices and stuff like this, which from our perspective are horrendous, no? Um, yeah, maybe it's good that that is not uh, working anymore, you know, and that's uh, perfectly fine. But still, the, the good parts of, of these, uh, how can I say, of these ways of being in the world, we should keep and cherish instead of saying, oh, that's all primitive, you know, because they had human sacrifice. Oh, we, we get rid of this. Oh, we are much better now. Yeah. We're doing a lot of human sacrifice in many other ways, you know, <laughs> but we don't really realize that. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that I am carrying a little bit of this energy and I think you are right. I think I sort of tapped into that, into that part of, of life energy there. Or maybe it's also the, 
mind opening thing, you know. It's not only mind, it's also heart. It's the whole body. It, is, it was a whole body experience in, in so many ways, you know. And this comes to me now as a natural thing of being, a natural way of being. Um, and I have a sort of refusal to, as I call it, mind fuck about theories any, anymore and, and much longer, you know, because it seems to me like out of out of somewhere, you know, somewhere flying in the air and not really connected to what is really important. It's good that you have a sort of theory, you know, as they have the spiral dynamic movement in South Africa, they have the theory, yes, but they live it. They don't talk about it and, and split the, how do you say, split the last atom to find out uh, where you could go with it, but they just have it as a framework and use it for life. And I think we should come back to that. So whenever we are talking too much about theory, I will probably zoom out because it's not anymore my interest because it's too much distant from the rest of who we are. That's what I feel. When you integrate it with the rest, it's good, you know, but if you are only in theory, that's, that's the thing, what I'm contesting a little bit. I'm, I'm curious, you know, you've, you've gone to a radically different culture and environment and kind of been transmitted this kind of essence or, or gift that has, you know, kind of seemed like it kind of helped to kind of loosen your, some of your implicit frameworks that, uh, of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of curious, like, what is the next step for you in, in, in integrating this and, and not you know, forgetting. I mean, I've done a lot of foreign travel too, and I'm back in the U.S. for a month and I forgot, you know, so it's kind of like, and, and how, how do you envision you kind of like really integrating this on that cellular subtle level and, and, and how do you think it will express itself in your, you know, current life back in Italy? Uh, one thing which was important was this shamanic uh, thing, you know, which has, I'm, I'm normally doubtful about these woo-woo things, you know. Uh, <laughs> and with this woman seeing things so clearly and having had other experiences with past life regressions and things, which is always, you know, is it true? Is it not true? Yeah, blah, 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 blah. And this woman seeing these things in my life without knowing me at all, I thought, oh, maybe... I should take it more seriously that there is much more to life and reality than we normally think. Much more um, of an, let's say, other world, no? this subtle uh, realm that this is real and that I can maybe um, trust a little bit better in what we call intuition or, or whatever, you know, that I don't have to doubt so much and integrate it as a tool and maybe in some way, but who are, I don't know if I can that, develop a little bit these capacities of, of sensing better, you know, of uh, getting into these energy things. And then maybe it, it is already quite late. Maybe we can do a, still another session about the conference and I go through the, the, the contributions I, I participated, I did the role of the have nots in the constellation. And that was the ultimate experience of how it feels when you are really at the bottom of, of the chain. So I could uh, talk a little more about this, but I don't think we, we want to go over now. Or what did you plan? I mean, we we have something in half an hour, but so if you wanted to share like a highlight or something from the conference or something, you know. Yeah, the highlight for me was definitely this uh, uh, constellation, the African constellation, where 20 roles were given. The haves, the have-nots, the migrants, the blacks, the whites, the, mm. uh, the fear, the anger, the, I don't know, 20 roles. I don't have them all, all present. And I played the have-nots. And 
you know, I thought, haha, yeah, I, I always feel that I don't have enough uh, money and things. So I want to explore how it feels like uh, being a have not, you know, and maybe I can heal this idea which I have. And then I entered into the constellation circle and it struck me. My body went like this, you know, and my hand, don't know if you see that, went like, like this, opening the hand to want to get it began to shake and I watched myself and said, Hey, what is that? You know, it, it's, it's not me who is doing that. I could have stopped it. That was clear. I could have put my mind into it and said, no, 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 no. But I just was curious and let it go. No. And at a certain point I fell on the floor and I saw myself scratching, trying on the, on the, on the carpet and trying to go somewhere, find something. It was, wow, <laughs> I tell you, that was, I think, the most important experience I had. The playing the role of people who are really not having anything and trying to survive in some way. And then there was, I didn't not see what else happened around me, but I saw several people coming to me, attached to me, and somebody even seemed to have put a foot on me. I can only speculate at this point. We will work on it uh, later and I will understand what happened uh, when the others give, give their, um, their written account, what, what happened for them, then I can see what happened to me. But it seemed that somebody stepped on me and I felt really, ah, and then I was dead. I really felt now dead. And this was a strange state of giving up just surrendering to the suppression in many ways or the impossibility to <clears throat> to get somewhere. Um, and then at a certain point, then I sort of revived again. I felt that some energy came and then somebody came and took my arm and, 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 uh, dragged me over the carpet for a little bit, not far. And then somebody else came and then they pulled me up. And then I was in uh, standing again and then I could also see around me. And it was like, ah, you know, here I am and now. It was also a strange experience. And then I felt quiet just being, I'm here, standing here. And then came anger and wanted to attach on me, the role of anger, no? They tried to get me. And I felt, no, I don't want anger. I'm not angry. There was a strange missing of emotions for a long time when I was revived, you know? Just being in the present now. It's not even okay, it's just as it is, you know? You did, I didn't give any label to that. Not not okay, not not okay, just, ha, huh, so it is. And then uh, I noticed the um, reappearance or the appearance of anger. It's like a new life force came in and then it expressed itself in anger. So I went and tried to find anger and stayed with anger for a while. And up to a point where it didn't fit me anymore. No, but anger wanted you, you, she really wanted to, to keep me and was attached to me. And I really had to flee from this anger and defend myself against anger, which all these things I found it very um, symbolic, you know, very, no. In, the, in, the, in your own process, the anger has a place, but it doesn't need to stay. And even if, if you want to go away and anger at, is attached to you, then you have to work to get rid of the anger and to come into this state of almost equanimity. It was not perfect equanimity, but it was quite, quite that. It was more than a sort of a relief to be 
around and have a place, although it was not very defined the place, but it was a place. And then I, the migrants came to me and the shame came to me. That was an interesting encounter because shame seems to make a, play a big role when you are down somewhere in the, in the lower. And then hope. For a long time, hope was attached to me and up to the end. At the, at the end, we were hope. I was together with the blacks. The blacks were all alone. As long as I could see, the blacks were all alone and nobody wanted to connect to them. And so I went to them. And we stayed together and then hope came and then the soul came too at the end. So we were this group of hopeful <laughs> final image. But I tell you, that was worthwhile to go to the conference, at least in my eyes. And the day later, some people said, oh, you performed that so perfectly. I said, me? I didn't perform anything. <laughs> it pe performed it with me, you know. It was not, I couldn't perform a thing like this. I wouldn't even know what to do, you know. It's just tapping into this different space. And together with the healers, um, Sangomas, Sangomas experience, these realities, these uh, fields seem to me much more clearly that they exist and that they are reality and not some fancy idea of somebody but you can feel them you can be influenced by them and influence them at the same time so that opens for me a completely new no not completely new but completely more real um outlook on what i might be doing in the future you know exploring more these other spaces of of reality um, with meditation i never never rarely went into these spaces. It's, it's somehow different. But in these occasions, wow. <laughs> so. Wow, well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, um, even just listening to you talk about, it, I feel something opening in my, you know, brain or mind or something. So you're yeah. I think it's it's contagious. It's contagious because when I tell you and I'm I sort of stay already or still in this field mm -hmm. and we are connected, um that I wouldn't be astonished when that happens, you know. Great. Yeah, I, I feel similarly. This I was just I was just thinking basically about like um I said, like, maybe this is a bit over the top, but it's almost like you, you kind of do a little bit of service to the rest of us just by uh, bringing this like really deep stuff back, especially like actually going there, not just like, oh yeah, no, I've read more into whatever level and stuff like this. And um, yeah, I just, I don't know, it, I'm kind of inspired. Um, I think as well sort of extrapolating to the group, I sort of realized like through our course and stuff like this, like somebody always brings some really unique flavor of something that needs to be integrated. It's quite uh, uh, precious. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I sort of, I don't know, I feel like I'm lost in some space. <laughs> <laughs> I can't necessarily articulate, but it, um, yeah, it feels good. I'm glad that you are were listening and asking the questions. And I want, uh, maybe at the end, we have another appointment in a short time. I wanted to, to say that it's not, when you go as a tourist, normal tourist to South Africa, you probably won't get this uh, experience because you can easily find uh, the same things as you have at home. You know, there are places where it's exactly like uh, <clears throat> in the rest of Europe or America and you can avoid the other places, you know, where the people really are crunched together in, in little spaces and houses without green and, and families in, <clears throat> in, 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 in poverty. So you can have a perfect, wonderful South African experience without seeing reality. But the good thing was that we had the, the guidance, you know, of, of, of these people who are deeply in spiral dynamics for many, many years and know the reality perfectly, you know, so 
um, that they they shared their wisdom. They shared what what they what they knew. I I might have forgotten everything. You cannot record uh, everything. I might have forgotten some something, not everything, but it opened up a new way of understanding. Instead, when you have a normal tourist guide, you know, in and out. So this gave you a possibility, even if you don't remember the details, but you remember the the main thing, the essence of, 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 of what you were living. So I'm very grateful to them. And I recommend to you, if this is another time next year in two years, try to save some money and go there because it's unique. I love, love the, to go to the conferences and the tours in Hungary, but Hungary is still sort of Europe, you know. They have poor regions there too, but like Johannesburg, this clash of, let's say, cultures, clash of uh, possibilities of what people have and can do, that was very surprising to me. And get the context provided by our <clears throat> guides. guides. Well, thank you so much, Heidi, for that. And uh, yeah, I really, I really hope to uh, continue this discussion with you and, and continue to uh, leech off some of your experience. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> when I hope the, the keynote speakers, they will be published. So when they are out, I think we should talk about the conference and maybe you can have a, a, a glimpse into, into what was said. There were many interesting things. Some were not so interesting to me. It was much about business. Uh, things too, because that's interesting also for them. But, you know, I was so glad that in Africa, which I thought before, yeah, it's far away, that there is interest in integral theory and in <clears throat> application of uh, it and spiral dynamics, and they try their best to, to, to help the country to survive, let's say, you know, in a good way. So it's very pioneering work and hmm. It was good to see also so many black people because we were talking about black and white who are deeply into it and committed to to make the world a better place and not only their country. So it's very good. Okay, so when we have, uh, when I have more of the material, then we can talk about the what was happening on the conference apart from the constellation. Okay. Great. Sounds, Sounds great. great. Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Yeah, Thank you. Thanks, thanks you for your your questions. It really helps me, you know. I'm not so good in writing, then I lose myself and it seems also boring. But when I can tell you, that's that's fine. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Yep.